think of all that expenses. You're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars that get spent on this. And people usually who get sent to prison for nonviolent drug use come out as violent criminals. So it makes no sense at all to pursue this method because marijuana is not going to increase car accidents. Let me tell but you, would, that I is would... not the case. I would think that it's hard to detect if you're high on marijuana when you're pulled over by the police. There's no breathalyzer test. So how would we know what effect it has? Well, well that, that, that's... Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, Mr. Paul. Go ahead, Ron. Well, that, that's a, that's a possi possibility, but even under today's circumstances, uh, nobody gets arrested for it. And uh, the alcohol is the real culprit and the real problem, and yet we have people in Washington, D.C.'s who drink a lot of alcohol, let me tell you, because of political reasons, they're scared to death to even to vote to legalize the growing of hemp. Hemp has nothing to do with smoking marijuana. And because of this obsession on the drug war, we can't grow hemp in this country. We send the hemp growing up to Canada, then we buy the products that we make from hemp. So we export our jobs to Canada. Hemp is a good produ product that we prohibit from being used. And it was legal up until even after World War II, we were allowed to raise hemp in this country. This is how, how hysterical this war on drugs has gotten. So the sooner as we come to this realization, someday, actually I'm optimistic like this. I think this country is going to wake up like they did in the 30s and say, hey, you know, prohibition didn't work. Alcohol's a horror. It's made things worse. It's caused a lot of crime and a lot of violence. It's about time we just do this. Get rid of the prohibition. Let the regulation go back to the state. Regulate it like alcohol. And with the real regulation come from the individual and also from the family and the parents and the community. That's what prevents drug use, not some federal thug coming in with guns and arresting some kid and throwing him in prison for life. That makes no sense whatsoever. Are you saying that there are a lot of alcohol? Alcoholics in Congress? Is that what I heard you say? No, no, I didn't say that. I said there's a lot of. I said I said there's a lot of people in Congress who drink a lot of alcohol. Let me ask you something. And they and they won't and they won't vote to legalize the question. Hemp. They won't I even let question. us write. They won't even let us raise hemp because they're afraid of the yeah. political consequence. Is there I any drug question. you would not I legalize? Ron, I just want one more question to Ron, to Congressman. Is there any drug you would not... Was, do you want to legalize all drugs, heroin included? Well, I want to go back to a previous time prior to 1937 when the states did the regulating. Uh -huh. And I don't, I, don't advocate, I don't advocate giving marijuana to 10-year-olds walking in the store. But a ten, you know, the kids now can get more marijuana with all these laws easier than they can get alcohol. So the states have every right to regulate and okay. legalize and We're allow people of, to use these things. We're running out of time. Stephen, I'm going to give you the last word before we go. I'm just curious, uh, Joy, do you think that there's a lot of marijuana-smoking Ron Paul supporters? I'm just, I just, I'm just wondering. Um, yeah, have, you, but, have you ever smoked a joint, Ron? <laughs> Congressman Paul, have you ever smoked a joint? You know, this is the truth, and most people believe what I say. I have never seen anybody smoke marijuana, and I have never, never I been in, go. In, in the same room with them. Okay, thank you very much, you guys. Go to, to me. To me, it's the issue of freedom <laughs> of choice. Joy, joy, joy.
not issue the police officer's licenses to my client. Yeah, so they got really upset about it. Now they're busting them. They're trying to find something on them. It's really messed up. Man. So in this field alone, you're looking at $2 million worth of wholesale marijuana. By the time it hits retail on the streets, that can go up to $4.8 million. Marijuana and hemp is absolutely politically valuable, medically, environmentally, and of course economically. Think about today's economy. Now think what would happen if we just legalized marijuana altogether. Jobs. There would be almost an instant demand for growers to grow medical marijuana strains, as well as jobs needed to ship it and dispense it. Farmers will be needed to grow large crops of hemp and marijuana for its many uses, like creating jobs making paper, wrappers, plastics, cardboards, press wood, food, books, tourism, housing, furniture, cloth, Q-tips, pencils, nets, lotions, the list goes on so much it's ridiculous. Every single product and service that can be made needs workers to produce it, and every bit would be taxable, and people will pay it. Speaking about the taxpayer, how about saving them a little money as well? Well, marijuana can do that too. Ironic and as funny as it may sound, every military soldier, firefighter, park ranger, government contractor, transit worker, and even police officer can be uniformed in cloth made from marijuana. Imagine every cop who ever busted you for a roach now dressed head to toe in good old Mary Jane. And you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, and it would be manufactured and supplied for pennies. The truth is, when growing large amounts of marijuana and hemp, we will not only gain profit and bring life back to the economy, but we will have so much left over that we could give it away. As a social service, we can clothe and feed the homeless and less fortunate. We can do this with very little expense, bringing a higher quality of life to one of our most unfortunate situations. Let's also not forget the large percentage of crime that we will lose and put a stop to the millions turned into harder criminals after marijuana possession charges. And not to mention the major blow to power and money to the cartels and drug lords, whose corrupt power of dictatorship, murderers, smuggling, rape, kidnapping, car theft, etc. is not isolated to just Mexico alone. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. And uh, so I'm going to rip, because I'm born in New York. I talk fast. I got seven minutes. I don't got much time. But 
Let me say, first of all, please raise, how many of you have ever had somebody who you hold close in your heart struggle with drug addiction? Please raise your hands. How many of you have ever had somebody you hold close in your heart use drugs, smoke weed, whatever, and not have a problem with it? Raise your hands. How many of you, how many of you have had somebody you hold close in your heart who spent time behind bars on a drug charge? Raise your hands. I want to talk about all three of those things. I'm going to talk about all three of those things. And let me say, first of all, that the things I'm going to say, I'm going to get you going. I am going to get you going. And what I'm going to say, you know, uh, you know, you know, the views I hold are views that are held by other people who are white, black, brown, yellow, red, and everything in between. They're held by Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. They're held by people who've been addicted to drugs and people who love drugs. They're held by people who lost people, people who've been behind bars, people in law enforcement, whatever. And they're opposed by people from all those categories as well. So I just want to be clear, this is a point of view, and it's a point of view that I hope you will all open yourselves up to and think about, because I want to take you someplace on this. I'm going to talk about the harms of the drug war. And when I'm talking about the harms of the drug war, I am not coming at this personally, first and foremost, as somebody who is concerned about racial justice. I am coming at this first and foremost as somebody who is concerned about human rights. Right? I am a human rights activist. And when you are a human rights activist, and when you look at the phenomena of the war on drugs in the United States, you cannot escape the fact that this is not just a human rights issue, but an issue of racial justice as well. Now, I want you to look at the numbers on this thing. The United States, our nation today, we have 5% of the world's population, less than 5% of the world's population. We have almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We rank first in the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. The Russians, the Belarusians keep huffing and puffing to keep up. They can't do it. We are number one in the world, number one when it comes to locking up our fellow citizens. When it comes to locking up people for drug charges, we went from having 50,000 people locked up on drug charges in 1980 to over half a million people today, never mind the hundreds of thousands or more on parole and probation violations related to drug charges. Right? You look at, the, we lock up in America more people for violating a drug law than all of Western Europe locks up for everything. And they got 100 million more people than we do. Right? Now, I want to ask you something. Do any of you think that would be possible if the vast majority of people behind bars were white? Any of you think that were possible? Because I know and I can see that there is something that happens in this country that when you see a television program, when you see a movie, a photograph, and when you see the pictures of the prison, po prison populations, and when you see they are overwhelmingly black, black men, brown men, that there is that little thing that clicks. That little thing that clicks. That's okay. That's right. Because I know that the vast majority of those people are white. We would not be leading the world in incarceration rates. I know that the movement for reform would be moving a lot faster than it is right now. And I'll tell you, when it comes to the war on drugs right now, when I look at that history of America, I can look from slavery to Jim Crow to the war on drugs. No better system has ever been created to, to accumulate massive, vast millions of people, black people primarily, and put them behind bars, give them a number, take them away from their homes, put them in upstate communities, dissolve their identity, treat them as second and third and fourth class citizens for the rest of their lives. That is what the war on drugs is doing today. Now. It's got to be changed. And changing it means struggling with ourselves as well. Because this was not just a matter of the war on drugs of white people and white races putting black people behind bars. Let's understand that the war on drugs that emerged in 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, that was a bipartisan struggle and a biracial struggle. That the people who supported those original crack powder laws were white and black. That the people who opposed needle exchange programs to stem the spread of AIDS were white and black that the people who bought into all of this hysteria were white and black. And that means, quite frankly, that we have to look in ourselves and in our fears and in deep, deep down and get ourselves uncomfortable because if we're going to uproot this from American society, it is only going to be from this critical self-examination. I want each one of you to please think back 20 years ago when crack was devastating inner city communities. Were you the one saying, lock them up, lock them up, put them behind bars? Do it. Were you, when people were saying that we needed needle exchange programs to stop the spread of AIDS, were you saying, I don't want to give a drug, give a needle to a junkie? Why would I enable their addiction? Were you the one saying that? And now maybe you understand that that's not right? 
Because there is a price to a slow learning curve. When other nations understood what was right 20 years ago, we were slow. And the price of our slowness was an incarcerated population that now leads the world. The price of our slow learning curve was hundreds of thousands of people dying of HIV AIDS. We can no longer afford